so much for joining us today. This is Ellen Kamai, the natural nurse. And as always, I'm wishing you the best. And you can get in touch at naturalnurse.com anytime about the many people who listen to the show and they say on their radio everywhere in the country because they download it and then they play it somehow. I don't know how, but you young people probably know how, right on the radio in their car. So that's always wonderful. And we have lots of classes available for you. We have two classes coming up that have CE credits for massage therapists, nurses, acupuncturists, registered dietitians, and many other professionals. And that's coming up in March. Just look at naturalnurse.com calendar. One is a four-part series that leads to a natural nurse herbal certificate. So it's a certification program that you could use towards becoming a full-fledged registered herbalist. To be a registered herbalist involves more training, and I mentor individuals, take them through the process of becoming a registered herbalist. But on the way, you can get the Natural Nurse Herbal Certification, and we also have a great class coming up called Career Paths in Natural Health. Have you ever thought that perhaps you'd like to include some aspect of natural health in what you do for a living. Well, there's more possibilities than you might know. For instance, the natural products industry is one of the fastest growing industries in the United States. At Expo West in Anaheim, California every year, There are 70,000 participants. That is really huge for any kind of industry. There's so many jobs available, all the way from being a nutritionist and an herbalist to perhaps you're a graphic design artist, but maybe you'd like your job to be making herbs instead of making something you don't really connect with. So there's so many opportunities, and I invite you to join our group class, which is Careers in Natural Health health, and that's coming right up at naturalnurse.com. Now, today, we're very happy to have as our guest, Dr. Anna Garrett. Dr. Garrett has been a clinical pharmacist for over 20 years and has worked in a variety of practice settings. While traveling her career path, she discovered that working with women in midlife is her true passion, and she offers a variety of services, including hormone balancing, weight loss, and health coaching designed to help women in perimenopause and menopause. Escape from what she calls hormone hell. I loved it personally. I loved it one of my favorite times of life, but anyway, and feel amazing in their bodies so they can rock their mojo through midlife and beyond. Dr. Anna is passionate not only about helping women get their hormones balanced, but also teaching them to advocate for themselves in the healthcare system. Dr. Anna received her Bachelor of Science and Doctor of Pharmacy degrees from UNC Chapel Hill and is a board certified pharmacotherapy specialist. She is also a certified intrinsic coach and has studied through the American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine. And she works with her clients virtually, for those of you listening to our show, um, out of town as well as locally. So thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Anna. You asked me to participate. Yes, thank you so much for being on our show. What is the best website for people to find you at? It's www.dranagarrett2rs2t's.com. Well, thank you so much. And people can find you there, and we'll be announcing that throughout the show. And we also archive this show, and we'll send you a link, Dr. Anna, so you can share it um, with your clients as well. Great. I'd love to do that. This is an interesting bio because um, what made you want to become a pharmacist in the first place? Um, That's a really interesting question. So I, um, I, the pharmacy was not my first career. My first career was actually working for Domino's Pizza, doing marketing and supervising stores. And when I was 27, 
I realized that I either had to move to Michigan or Atlanta if I wanted to continue to work with Domino's. And I um, was married at the time to a pharmacist, and I thought that uh, it looked like a good career, and I had lots of friends that were pharmacists. So I'd like to say that there was some, like, major pull to pharmacy, but there actually was not. It was something that I thought would be interesting. I loved medicine, and I was like, well, this looks like a good choice for me, so off I, off I went, and then the story gets a little more interesting after that. Oh, good. Please share that with us. Well, so I had intended um, when I became a pharmacist to work in the retail setting, um, but once I got into my clinical rotations and did some hospital work, I realized that that was actually the path I wanted to take. So I ended up doing a residency and created a job um, for myself at the hospital I did my residency at. And from there, I have created um, a number of jobs, mostly in ambulatory care. But in 2011, I decided that working in the corporate realm really was not what I felt like was my calling anymore. And so I had taken a coaching certification program and um, was trying to figure out, okay, what do I want to do? And I I decided to start my own business. And my intention when I did that was just to basically do life coaching with women in midlife. But I was like, well, I spent a long time in pharmacy school, so I'm not really sure I want to give that up. Um, So I have a a friend who's a compounding pharmacist at uh, an area um, compounding pharmacy near me, and I went and spent a, spent a day with her. And at that point, I realized that I could combine the hormone balancing work with the midlife coaching, and that's how it all started. Well, that is a wonderful progression. That's what I was talking about earlier. I'm actually teaching a class on career paths and natural health mm. because I see that you also moved with the American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine, which I was very involved with them when they started up, as a matter of fact. Um, okay. Dr. Serafina Corsella was one of the initiating members, and she was a holistic physician. I was her head nurse for 25 years. So I know they have a real focus on natural it's not right. the same as just going to some other pharmacy conference. Right, exactly. Um, and, you know, as I started the business, I realized I needed some more training. So I, I um, completed their endocrinology module, and that was kind of what kicked things off. Um, I have since uh, enrolled in the School of Applied Functional Medicine, so I'm trying to broaden my area of areas of expertise. Oh, you're not just trying. That is a serious commitment, Dr. Anna. Oh, That's my gosh. That's a difficult course. A serious it's a, commitment. <laughs> yes. It's the highest level of training. You get trained in all the latest diagnostic tools, and you're a pharmacist already. So you begin to really understand, you know, how limited conventional pharmacy is in terms of addressing issues only with pharmaceutical drugs. Oh, yeah. Um, and... The, the interesting thing is, is um, you know, I put myself on this path, and there are a lot of pharmacists who, you know, they're all about the evidence-based and this and that. And so, you know, when that runs up against the natural approach, and there aren't a lot of studies with some natural products because there's no money in it for drug companies, um, it, it, it can cause quite a few arguments, shall we say. But... Um, I think there are more pharmacists now who are looking to serve their patients in a higher way. Um, so, for instance, there is a, there's a, a group called the um, Functional Medicine Pharmacists. So that's growing by leaps and bounds. And then um, I've also been in, uh, involved in starting a group called Metapreneurs, which is um, a conference we put on every year for healthcare providers who want to start their own business, and a lot of those people are in the health um, health coaching realm or want to provide services in an, a more alternative way than just uh, what can be done in a regular pharmacy. What did you say about th- that second group that you started? What's that called? Metapreneurs. It's M E D I. P-R-E-N-E-U-R-S. 
Well, I will tell you that I would like to apply to be a presenter there. I do present almost every day all around the country and, and the world. And that's something I'm really sharing now because I've been doing all natural medicine since 1964. Wow. Yes, you were like on the, on the leading edge. Yes, that's, yeah, that is true, but it isn't true because I had my teachers, you know, such as Ann Wigmore and Dr. Bernard Jensen and many of the people who were in the generation earlier, but definitely this has been my focus and I combined it with being an RN, being a PhD, having advanced nursing degrees, et cetera, because having the degrees like you do gives a lot of credibility to what we know, and it is evidence-based. Like what you said about the studies, truthfully, I spend my days catching all the latest studies on herbal medicine, Mm -hmm. on nutrition, on food and outcomes. I actually think it's powerful evidence to support that way of taking care of ourselves. Well, it's it's definitely not something that's taught in pharmacy school. Um, yes, that I, I agree with. Yes, that's they, true. Um, when I was in pharmacy school the, the year before, they had just gotten rid of the pharmacognosy course that they taught, which would have you know given me some of that background. And to my knowledge, I mean, I don't know how many programs include anything about herbals because um, I know I have a, a colleague that. Uh, that lives here in Asheville that went to conventional pharmacy school, but she actually um, went to herbalist school um, to augment her knowledge about herbal products and is moving more into that realm. So I see, you know, kind of a, a shift in thinking among some pharmacists because, I mean, we're not always getting the outcomes that we want for our patients with traditional pharmaceuticals. Um, and, and I have, I mean, my clients... My ideal clients don't want to go that route. and That's what happens, exactly. Right. So it becomes a matter of serving your constituencies. More and more individuals want to know about, you know, perhaps something that has a lower adverse effect profile. Right. Perhaps something that isn't going to interfere with other medications, although there can certainly be herb drug med- interactions, but they're not as severe as drug drug interactions. So absolutely. I just want want to share with you one thought process, which is when we talk about the word traditional, traditional means herbal medicine and natural medicines, traditional Chinese (laughs) medicine, right? No, it's not your fault. Everybody does that. I'm just a big stickler about that. And we don't want to throw out conventional pharmaceuticals. They are fantastic and life-saving and necessary when used correctly. And there's a time and a place. I just think they are overused more or less abused, and that unfortunately both physicians and pharmacists are taught in medical schools and pharmacy schools that that is, seems to be the only right. thing to try, even with minor symptoms. And that's where I think the problem lies. Well, um, pharmaceuticals kept my mother alive for 10, lo- 10 years longer than she would have had otherwise. And, Absolutely. There's and so a, I, no you doubt. Know, I'm <laughs> very grateful that... Um, the amount of research that was done in the multiple myeloma realm was done because it, it resulted in lots of new therapies for that. Um, but I think as a first step, I mean, the first step with my clients is lifestyle um, cleanup, and it makes a huge difference for them in how their hormones um, behave. And, you know, a lot of people don't want to do that work because it's, it's a lot of work to really change your lifestyle around, and they get... You know, they, they want a magic bullet, so those people are not my ideal clients. Um, so I, I send them elsewhere, um, or we, you know, talk through a plan that they can manage because my, my approach is to meet people where they are initially and then take the incremental steps toward um, something that is going to help them feel better. That is so excellent because you have the deep training and knowledge as a pharmacist. So it's certainly science-based, evidence-based, and you are taking the steps to not only in the past but continuing increase your knowledge about traditional interventions and what might be more appropriate for that individual at that particular time. 
So what exactly. led you to specialize in perimenopause and menopause? I just want to ask, are you old enough to where that's been your experience? Yes, I am 59, and I actually just became menopausal like three weeks ago. <laughs> so oh, my I'm God, congratulations. It gets better um, from there. <laughs> so so I, I specialized in that because I was my ideal client, and um, I knew how to, to speak to what women were experiencing, and I had the background to be able to help them, and um, it just seemed like a natural fit for me. I mean, if anybody had told me 15 years ago that I would be um, talking about menopause and helping women with that, I would have told them that they were crazy because I was an infectious disease specialist at that point. Uh, so, um, I, you know, what? I, I really, I really am disturbed when I see women suffering so much and not getting the knowledge they need from their health care providers. Um, are you are you familiar with the AARP study that came out? I don't know. It's probably been about eight months ago now. And what was that sharing? Um, so they they asked physicians, OBGYN uh, residents, actually, how comfortable they were um, talking about hormones with patients, and I think twenty percent of them said that they were comfortable. Twenty um, percent? Uh huh. <laughs> That's awful. And these are OBGYNs, so these are not general practice people. These are the people who are supposed to be... Wait a minute, that's like shocking. How is that even possible? Isn't that a large part of their practice? Well, as somebody told me, OBGYNs are really in business to help people have babies. Um, and Okay, but what about the GYN part? And what about the infertility part? And, what you know, there's like yep. a lot to it. <laughs> Well, so so the residency programs, for the most part, don't include specific training on hormones, and the ones that did, the ones that do actually, for the most part, have it have it as an elective, so it's not required. And and so we wonder why why women aren't getting answers. Well, that's part of the problem right there. And the other part, in in my personal opinion, is that the medical system is not set up to incentivize physicians to learn about hormones because the average level three medical visit is seven minutes long. Well, you can't really get into a lot of root cause in seven minutes. Um, So it's easier to write a prescription for birth control or antidepressants or anti-anxiety medications and just send the, the, the patient on her way. Yeah, you know, this is the problem. As you know, what's going on now in most medical, conventional medical offices, not traditional, but conventional is that the physician is on one side of the room looking at the computer, Mm -hmm. looking over his or her shoulder at the client. And most of his or her attention in terms of the doctor is trying to find the right code. Right. To put into this computer. I mean, they don't smell the patient, touch the patient. And, you know, it's not the provider's fault. It's the way this entire system is set up, which seems to be focused on one and only one purpose. And that seems to be to maximize prescription sales. That's what it looks like the whole entire thing is geared towards, rather than really focusing on health and wellness for the individuals. Well, physicians are, are on productivity um, models, and if you know if they don't see more patients, they don't make more money. Um, I'm not sure. I agree, it's designed to maximize um, pharmaceutical sales, but it is designed to maximize you know what they can get out of a physician as far as the number of patients they see, because that's where the revenue comes from, and insurance companies keep cutting back the amount that they reimburse for patient visits. And so it's like being a hamster in a wheel. You have to go faster and faster to bring in the amount of income to sustain the practice. And practices have these huge overheads now because they have to have so much staff to deal with the insurance company. So it's just like, it's it's a nightmare. Um, It is. And the whole entire concept, like let's say myself as a patient, What's amazing is when you get a bill 
there's some kind of out of control amount on there mm-hmm. that's that's kind of manufactured. Well, I'm on Medicare, like way, 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 way past menopause. And, and then there's like, okay, so what the Medicare amount is. I mean, it's just all like not really based in reality. Oh, no. In, ter- it's, it's in terms of cost, in terms of time, in terms of patient care. Well, and that's why more and more physicians are going to concierge models where, you know, a, a client buys into the practice um, for some fee that usually is like three or $4,000 a year, and they get their labs paid for, and they get uh, a certain number of physician visits, and um, they get more time with the physician because they're not taking insurance. They're, they're just using this concierge model. But the unfortunate part of that is that there are people that can't afford to pay that. And so they end up getting a lower quality of care, in my opinion, than the people that can afford to go to a practice like that. So now, as a pharmacist, I just visited a pharmacist right here in um, in Florida, so she's close to here, and she's a PharmD, and she has shifted to actually do, she works with a doctor who's in the office also, but she actually visits with clients, and she does, she's an herbal specialist, and she also works a lot with cannabis, which, by the way, is legal in Florida in terms of medical interventions, Mm -hmm. but she's so knowledgeable, and also went to the functional medicine route. And don't people really trust pharmacists, even the general public? Yeah, pharmacists at one point were the most trusted professionals um, of of all. I think nurses have gone back up to the top. (laughs) Yay, Um, nurses. That's me. But that's true. (laughs) Nurses and pharmacists rank a lot higher than physicians in terms of um, competency that is related to a perception of clients. Well, and, and, and a pharmacist spend six years in school to learn about medications, and most medical schools, um, the physician trainees get maybe six months of training on, on drugs. Um, and so, you know, we, we are the medication experts, um, and th- there are more and more uh, pharmacists who are working in physician offices. I actually did that uh, in the early 2000s. I started a program for a big physician practice near where I was living at that point. And, you know, it's great because the pharmacist can spend more time with the patients and, you know, actually educate them and not just run in and out of the room. So it, it's a win for everybody because from a professional satisfaction standpoint, that's the best job to have. Yeah, that's a, and then and then your job if you're in an office like that is to take time with people, right? Re- review their pharmaceuticals, look deeply for drug drug interactions, which yes. are usually ignored to the great detriment of the client because you know sometimes one doctor gave you one thing and the other doctor gave you another thing and you go to two different pharmacists to pres- get them and nobody knows like the whole cohesive picture of what's going on. Exactly, and, and that's why I always tell people to please use one pharmacy because um, at least that way all of the medications are in one place um, if they're not shopping around and using different pharmacies for different things. Well, that's a great tip. We're going to go to a little break right here. Our guest today is Dr. Anna Garrett, very, very knowledgeable woman, and we're going to be talking about her focus topic of menopause and perimenopause and share her information about it, and you can find her at, at DR, right? DRAnnaGarrett.com. We'll be right back with more right here on The Natural Nurse and Dr. Z. On this edition of The Natural Medicine Chest, we'll explore the medicinal properties of the plants of the ephedra genera, focusing on the traditional Chinese ephedra, also known as ma huang. Many species of the plant ephedra are used today in medicine throughout the world. The most medicinal of these are ephedra sinica, or Chinese ma huang, and ephedra nevadensis, also known as Mormon tea. Most of the research on ephedra has been performed on ma huang, whose stems and branches have been used as a traditional Chinese medicine for over 5,000 years in the treatment of asthma, hay fever, bronchitis, as well as the common cold. 
ephedra species are erect evergreen shrubs which grow in segmented bamboo-like joints reminiscent of straw ending in thin wisps. They typically are desert plants, preferring arid conditions on dry, rocky, and sandy slopes. The Chinese ephedra, ma huang, has earned an impressive reputation as a source of the alkaloid chemical called ephedrine. In the West, scientists became interested in the medicinal usage of ma huang after they isolated ephedrine and pseudoephedrine in 1923. Today, synthetic derivatives have become widely used in prescription and over-the-counter medications. In 1993, over 40 million prescriptions in the U.S. contained these alkaloids. Ephedra and its relatives are considered to act pharmacologically as sympathomimetic compounds. This means that they stimulate the sympathetic part of our central nervous system, responsible for the release of adrenaline, which leads to the fight-or-flight response. Ephedra also affects the cardiovascular system by increasing the blood pressure, and causes a relaxation and dilation of the bronchial smooth muscles in asthmatics. Ephedra can shrink the swelling of the delicate mucous membranes which line the respiratory system, thus drying up watery discharges, unstuffing clogged nasal and sinus passages, which accompany colds, sinus conditions, and allergies. In both animal and human studies, Mahuang has been shown to accelerate weight loss. It has been shown not only to suppress appetite, but to increase the metabolic activity of the adipose or fat tissue. Therefore, ephedra's weight-reducing effects are most significant in individuals who have a low metabolic rate or a sluggish thyroid gland. Mahuang is a powerful herb which, when abused, can cause some unwanted side effects. Ephedra should not be taken by those with high blood pressure, nervousness or anxiety, insomnia, cardiac conditions, or pregnancy. Studies indicate that when used in conjunction with other Chinese herbs in a traditional formula, Ma Huang does not have any of these effects and has remarkable beneficial effects on human health. We recommend consulting a healthcare practitioner knowledgeable in the use of botanical medicine before using Ma Huang so you can be further educated about its totality of effects. And, before using herbal preparations with Ma Huang, check to see if you are sensitive to its effects by starting with the minimal dose and working up to a therapeutic dose. Logically, since ephedra is a stimulant itself, it should be used prudently with other stimulants, beverages, or drugs with stimulant effects. Again, consult with your natural healthcare practitioner. So, listeners, remember Ma Huang, the traditional Chinese ephedra, and make sure to include it in your natural medicine chest. Welcome back for more right here on Natural Natural Nurse and Dr. Z right here on Progressive Radio Network. Our guest today is Dr. Anna Garrett, who has been studying for years all aspects of medicine, both conventional and moving into traditional. So she is a wonderful person to consult with, and we're going to focus on how do you get the care you need and deserve in menopause? So that's a good question, Dr. Anna. How would somebody get the the personal attention from you if they wanted someone to walk them through menopause with a greater level of comfort? Well, the, the first step is to reach out and schedule a consultation with me. Um, that is the first step uh, to um, working with me and, and considering testing. So that consultation is designed to really get into uh, what a woman is experiencing and what the next best steps for her would be. And uh, your listeners can access that on my website um, under the Work With Me tab. It's called the Let's Talk Call, and uh, that's, that's a great place to start. Now, let's talk about your view of hormone testing, because we only touched that briefly. So I, um, you know, there's a lot of controversy about that, and, and 
many physicians will say it's not worth doing because hormones uh, go up and down all day. Well, you know, that really is true of about any kind of test that we do, so it's not just limited to hormones. But even, even though they vary some during the day, I can still, on a, on a test, see the magnitude of the imbalances of, say, estrogen to progesterone, and that's what's really important is that ratio. So um, I use a dried urine test, which I, I love uh, not only because it gives me the levels of the sex hormones, but because it also shows me the metabolic pathways that the woman's body is using to eliminate the hormones. And we can do some manipulation of those pathways if she, for instance, is, um, if, if a lot of her estrogen is being metabolized into the pathway that increases risk for breast cancer, we can manipulate that so it goes into a safer pathway and is eliminated from her body and not recirculated. Right. And I would say most physicians don't even look at that. But we tested such a wide range, um, even this is t- uh, over 20 years ago, because we would look at th- at least three different kinds of estrogen, mm-hmm. like yes, estradiol, exactly. yeah, estriol, um, you know, the, the usual estradiol that they always do in estrone. And we did progesterone, DHEA, DHEA yep. sulfate and testosterone for yep. every woman. And and now, you know, if you, if you go to uh, um, your OBGYN or your general practice physici- physician, they're probably going to test your FSH and your LH, which tells you nothing about your hormone balance. Um, and, you know, with lifestyle, poor lifestyle choices and exposures to xenoestrogens that act like estrogen, You know, women get out of balance very quickly, and the thing that I think contributes the most to hormone imbalance is stress, because if cortisol is running the show in your body, everything's going to be thrown off. So it's so wonderful that you're able to do that testing. Now, how is that done at a distance if someone were to consult with you from another area and not come to your office? So I keep the test kits um, in my office, and when a a client decides to work with me, I ship the kit to them. They do it in the privacy of their home and send it back to the lab, and then the lab sends me the results. And then I um, I schedule a consultation with them on Zoom so that we can see each other, and I walk them through the test results, and I also at that point have created a customized plan based on their results and a health history that they send me uh, that we also go over. And um, then we figure out where they're going to start because not everybody wants to do everything all at once. And I I actually am not a fan of doing everything at once either because then you can't tell what's working and what's not. Oh, yeah, definitely, myself included, because that's the the whole art of prioritizing a therapeutic for an individual. And as you already said, um, lifestyle would certainly play a big part in that. Oh, yeah, it's it's huge. And, and, and I said that was the first step. So that, that is the first step with all of my clients. And, um, you know, just getting them, for instance, I had, a, I had a client once who was having terrible night sweats, and she was drinking a couple of glasses of wine every night. And I said, well, stop that and see what happens. And her night sweats went away completely. So it can be something as simple as that, and it can be something as complex as somebody who needs to or or wants to lose a lot of weight because they're starting to have health issues. So I work with people on that as well. Um, And it all starts with the hormone testing so we can get the imbalances managed so that it's not like swimming upstream when you want to lose weight because that's what I tell people it's like if you're way out of balance and your estrogen levels are really high it's going to be really hard to lose weight. That's true and one of the things that I noticed when I was going through that whole menopause thing which is more than you know many more years than a decade ago for me I actually did enjoy it to tell you the truth because I had studied so many things prior to actually experiencing it on my own and one thing that I used was Montauk Chia's 
microcosmic orbit and actually take the heat that sometimes starts in your feet and comes up your whole body Mm -hmm. and actually take that and consciously put it into my organs, in particular the um, adrenal glands like you're talking about with the cortisol response and actually saved that energy, saved that energy and honored it instead of seeing it as an issue. The other thing I did is I redid my wardrobe so because I, I lecture almost every day somewhere. So right in front of, you know, the crowd, of course, you're going to have this hot flash. Of course. I would have these sweater sets where it was like a sleeveless shell underneath and then a matching sweater. And I purposely had those because you're going to get like very, very hot. Then you're going to be freezing cold because of the sweat. I mean, and I would just gracefully take that stuff on and off. So I used sort of lifestyle modification to offset the terror of it. But, you know, some people find it a lot more frightening, annoying, and, and uh, interfering with their quality of life. Well, and I think it's so interesting what you said about taking that energy and, and storing it. Um, <clears throat> you know, I had never really thought about that, but so many of the women who are in my Facebook group, I, ha- I have a private Facebook group, and I think there's 3,700 women in there right now, um, so many women fight against what is, and in doing so, they raise their stress levels a ton, and the health anxiety just becomes overwhelming, and it just makes the whole experience awful. Um, and, and, and I realized that, that my experience of perimenopause was fairly easy. My, uh, insomnia was really my only uh, only thing that I had to deal with on a major on a major level. Um, I had that too. What I found that really worked well for that was a combination of sage and motherwort. Okay. So everyone can write that one down. And I would actually keep it at the bedside because sometimes the sleeplessness I have found with myself and others is that you fall asleep, but then you don't stay asleep. Right. And often you wake up with you know, sort of this monkey mind, like all the things in your life you have to deal with and worry about. Yep. And you can use sage and mother what many times in the middle of the night you go back to sleep and you wake up with no hangover. So that's a good one for that. Well, I, I opted for the oral progesterone prescription route plus some magnesium. And um, I also take a, a blend that has L-theanine and... I don't know, it's got a bunch of things in it, um, along with some phosphatidylserine. So that, that has actually worked for me really well. That's a wonderful protocol that definitely would help most people. I would use that very close to, like, the next level, you know, if the sage yep. and motherwort didn't work. But what's wrong with people? One thing that works, and I'm sure you'd agree, Dr. Garrett, is that taking the artificial hormones does work in terms of turning off those menopause symptoms for many women. Yes, it does. Um, the issue is, and, and I'm not anti-hormone by any means, obviously. I take oral progesterone, so um, I'm, I, I tell people that they'll have to pry that out of my cold, dead hand because it's, it's helped me so much. But um, the, the route that hormones are administered is really important. Um, I'm not a fan of the synthetics because even though they do the job, they can have some adverse effects, and um, especially when it comes to synthetic progestins, they've been associated with increasing breast cancer risk. Um, It's a small increase, but my opinion is why increase the risk at all if you have options that don't do that. Um, The Women's Health Initiative study that got everybody up in arms in 2002 when they, when they went back to re-examine that data, it was not the estrogen that was the problem. It was the synthetic progestin. So um, the oral progesterone works really well. The progesterone cream, if done correctly, can work really well. And then I'm, if somebody needs estrogen replacement, I'm, I'm a big proponent of patches or creams or anything topical because they haven't been shown to have the same risk for blood clots, heart attacks, and strokes. So you're not a big fan of using those, but in some, you know, there certainly are thousands of women who still use the artificial, feel great, and don't get side effects from it. So it's something that, you know, needs to be balanced for each individual. 
I mean, for me, it really, or not not for me personally, but for my clients, I tell them it really boils down to a quality of life decision. Um, so if they can manage whatever's going on with something that is not hormone replacement, I think that's great. If they can manage it with lifestyle, that's even better. But there are situations where someone's quality of life is so adversely affected that um, hormone replacement therapy m- makes perfect sense. Um, and in that, in that scenario, my preference is always to go with estradiol or, or some bioidentical form of the hormone. Now, that's a good word. You and I know what that means. Please explain to us, what do you mean by bioidentical hormone therapy? So bioidentical hormone therapy means that you are supplementing the hormones that are naturally produced by your body. So um, progesterone, for instance, that that is something that your body makes. And it's, it's synthesized from wild yam, but it is not wild yam cream. There's a compound called diostenin that's in that wild yam that has to be manipulated in the lab to be USP progesterone. And some people have tried to tell me that because it's manipulated in the lab, that makes it not bioidentical or natural. And I'm like, yes, it is. It's the same compound that your body would produce naturally if you were still ovulating. Yes, but it's similar um, in terms of the format to what you would have versus, let's say, what they're making in a laboratory. So have there been real studies looking at the fact that the bioidentical might be more um, lower risk in terms of using it than the conventional? Well, excuse me. Um, I am not aware. I'm racking my brain here, if you can't tell. No, no, because me either. (laughs) Right. I haven't seen those in-depth studies on the bioidentical proving safety, but certainly we used them in our clinic even almost 30 years ago now, and there didn't seem to be a lot of people popping up with cancer, but there wasn't a good analysis like there was with the conventional. But let's talk about why that is. So bioidentical hormones can't be patented. And if there's no patent available, that means there's no real money to be made. And drug companies are generally the only ones with deep enough, po- deep enough pockets to do a really rigorous clinical trial. Um, I know that... Uh, uh, shoot. I can't remember the name of the organization now, but I know that there are studies being done, not necessarily with bioidentical hormones, but with more herbal products. Um, and it's a federal it's a federal project. It's not a drug company sponsored project, where where they're getting more data about safety and efficacy of herbal products. Yes, but, and that's and that's a good option. I mean, we certainly haven't seen a whole rash of adverse effects popping up in the literature either, and there is an adverse effect reporting schedule that's in place. So, right. you know, I feel I feel like a lot of clients can use that, especially under the auspices of someone like yourself who's very knowledgeable at looking at the tests and evaluating What works for that individual? Because like you said, a lot of women, you know, going through menopause is very challenging because if your self-worth is linked to your youth, that's a very difficult level for you. Oh, yes. Yes, it is. (laughs) And that's not a battle you'll win. So um, No, that's right. And so I know someone like myself, for whatever reason, I really embrace every season of my life. I have to say I have loved the golden years the most. But then again, if I look back, I said that about pretty much every phase, except I have to say not child care. My children who are 45 and 40, I did not love being a young mother. That was my most unhappy part of life. But, you know, other people, that's what they do love. So, you know, we all have our various phases. We're going to go to a little break, and when we come back, we're going to continue our discussion with Dr. Anna Garrett. You can find her at drannagarrett.com, and she is a specialist in perimenopause and menopause, and she can help you up close or at a distance. She has groups online that you 
can join as well as uh, long distance consultations as well as local in her area. So we will be right back with more right here on The Natural Nurse and Dr. Z. I'm Gary Knoll, the founder of the Progressive Radio Network. Today we have more than 80 producers bringing forth the most progressive and most liberating information, the kind of information you do not regularly hear on any of the mainstream or alternative media. You can help us now. Up to this point, I have virtually supported the Progressive Radio Network, all of its expenses and payroll, myself. But we would like to expand our reach. We'd like to do far more. We'd like to be able to advertise on Facebook and let others know we exist. We are the number one progressive radio network in the world. In fact, we have programs that are most listened to in all of progressive radio. But we could go a lot further. Our message can reach a lot more people, especially at a time when people are desperate for honest, objective insights on the important topical issues of our day. How can you help? It's simple. Go to prn.fm. Go to our main page. In the upper right-hand corner, you'll see a little button, Support Now. And then whatever you can contribute on a monthly basis will make a big difference. It will help get the message out. It will help inform more people. It will give them more choices. This is where you'll hear in the independent candidates and the people looking to challenge the corruption in government and the industries. But we need to get our reach out further. So please, whatever you can afford on a monthly basis, and there's some suggestions there, and it'll be automatic. All right, thank you very much for continuing to help us help you and the rest of the world on these important issues. My name is Jordan Valerie, my pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'm here to tell you about the Millennial Politics Podcast. We speak with the next generation of progressive candidates, activists, and organizations dedicated to restoring our democracy and protecting our civil rights and liberties. Make sure to stay tuned for Tuesday at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, right here on the Progressive Radio Network, to hear the most recent episode of our podcast, and follow us on social media and iTunes to stay up to date with everything millennial politics. Listening to PRN Progressive Radio Network. And welcome back. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, boy, we're scheduling our herb walks where we take you outside and we gather edible and medicinal wild plants and make them into medicine. We also have upcoming classes on career paths in natural health for all of those of you who would like to include in your daily work and in your professional life different aspects of natural And that's a great class, Career Paths in Natural Health. That's on the calendar right now, as well as the Natural Nurse Herbal Certification course, which you can use towards becoming RH certified. RH is Registered Herbalist, and and that is a long-term commitment. Anybody who has an RH is a highly trained and recognized herbalist, and it's a great adjunctive degree for those who are serious about using herbs as part part of their uh, practice. So today we're so happy to have Dr. Anna Garrett on board. You can find her at dranagarrett.com and we're talking about her focus 
on menopause and perimenopause. Dr. Garrett, explain to us what is perimenopause. Perimenopause is the um, entire period from when your uh, hormone levels start to change all the way up to the day of menopause. Um, So that can last, on average, five to ten years for women. And then menopause is just one day of your life. Uh, It's the the day that marks a year since your last period. And then everything after that is postmenopause. So that perimenopause, I think a lot of people get shocked. I mean, some of yeah. them could be 40 years old, and some of the things yep. start changing. Yeah, even as, even as early as your late 30s. So it's, it's characterized by really big swings in hormones, and um, it can be a lot of nonspecific uh, symptoms, so fatigue and insomnia, mood swings, weight gain, heavier periods. And a lot of women who are, you know, around 40 don't really have that on their radar screen. And so that's why it's, it's sh- so shocking and also why I wrote a book that's about to be published hopefully next week um, <laughs> to help women understand what is coming in their reproductive life when perimenopause, when perimenopause appears. So that is wonderful that you'll have a book so you can more easily share with a larger audience. I myself have written 15 books, and that was really the reason to do it was way back when, you know, like I said, I've been doing this over 50 years now. You get to a point that you can only do one-on-ones with a certain number of people, yet you have so much information to share. Plus, for your clients, they could look at your protocol, and it can help them follow it with your guidance personally. So I'm so happy that you're doing that. And I know how much work it is also. It is. Yeah, it is. It's a lot. I've been doing it all day, every day for, you know, many, many decades. And you also very much are into the fact that there's no answer, like let's say a more conventional pharmacist, whatever somebody experiences, there's this drug for it. But you're looking more at the individual, and I'm sure your protocols might be more tailored to each person. Yeah, so when I, when I do testing with my clients, um, I, I take their results and based on what they've told me about their, their main symptoms that they need to address or what their goals are for themselves, I, I take that information plus the test results and create a customized plan just for them. So there's no, I don't think, I don't think I've ever done two that were alike. Um, so it's, it's fun for me because it's like a puzzle and everybody's different, and um, it gives the client what they need to be able to really uh, feel at home in their skin again because a lot of the women that I talk to feel like Mother Nature has uh, abducted them in some way, um, and they just, they just don't feel at home in their bodies. Right, and then there's the emotional component. So, of course, they're very often put on antidepressants when maybe just stop eating wheat would take care of it. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, I had a woman in my group yesterday ask about taking Trentelix for anxiety that's hormone-related. I'm like, no, (laughs) we're not doing that. (laughs) Um, I told her that was like using a cannon to shoot a fly uh, because, you know, so many of these antidepressants, are. this this one is an antipsychotic. And uh, I was like, you know, have you done any hormone testing to see, you know, what's lying underneath all of this? And she hasn't. Um, and I, I just think that it's easy to write a prescription for an antidepressant, but it just basically is a Band-Aid um, on what is really wrong. Well, you talked about some really excellent supplements when, you you know, you ran down what you might use for someone mm-hmm. suffering from night sweats. It was really funny to me. Like, I started waking up at night sweating, but it took me a long time to go, oh, that's night sweats, you know? Like, you realize it's you, what you've been reading about all these years. Yeah, so I, um, I actually had night sweats. If I eat sugar at night, that gives me night sweats. And I've been able to put those those two things together, and so I just I just don't do it anymore. Or if I do do it, I do it very consciously, knowing what is lying ahead for me. Um, but I'm a big fan of 
you know, adaptogenic herbs to help with stress. Um, like I said, magnesium makes a huge difference for a lot of my clients. Um, I'm trying to think of some of the other things that I'm that I'm. Well, you mentioned really, theanine. I think that's a great. Yes, thing. L-theanine. That's that's a really nice, uh, really nice um, calming uh, product. Um, so, yeah, because you are going to be stressed out, especially if you're not in, you know, the mindset of accepting these things gracefully. And even some therapy, I mean, you're also, you know, certified in coaching. So right. we can talk about the fact, really, is it normal? It is transitory, which I think is really supportive because I can tell you from a much older woman's perspective, like, it does go away for most women. Right, and so, exactly. That's a nice thing to know when you're right in the midst of it. Well, and I think another key, you know, another key thing that we don't really talk about a lot is that if you educate somebody about what is happening with their body and what to expect, um, it takes a lot of the fear and mystery out of it. And just, just that alone can really calm down anxiety just if people understand that what they're experiencing is very common and a normal part of a normal progression of reproduction right of life basically right and and so your um, alternative is like don't live long <laughs> you know that's not a good alternative no i don't think so <laughs> So I want to thank you so much for being our guest today right here on The Natural Nurse and Dr. Z. Do you have any parting words, Dr. Ann? Well, I would just encourage Dr. women if they're, you know, if they're experiencing symptoms of perimenopause or perhaps menopause to know that they're, that they're not alone and that there is help out there. And if they can't get it from their position, then think about other providers who can be helpful. So not only people like me, but um, acupuncturists, um, naturopaths. There's a whole there's a whole universe of healthcare out there that doesn't have MD behind their name that can be super helpful. Well, thank you so much for being our guest today, and thank well, you, listeners, for tuning in once again to the Natural Nurse and Doctor Z. We love your feedback. Get in touch at naturalnurse.com. Over three hundred thousand of you have. Um, and until next time, this is Ellen Kamai, the Natural Nurse, hoping that you stay healthy. 